Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy that we can be together and one of these days we'll be face to face. But until then, until then, the coronavirus does not win, but Jesus always does. So thank you for overcoming all the technical issues and problems that could be present and for choosing to join together in worship this day. I'm delighted to be together and I miss you. Let's pray. Thank you, God, so much for your presence in our lives. Thank you that you transcend all problems and that you invite us to be transfigured for the transformation of the world. Would you speak into us through your word this day that we might be your word living in this world? Thank you. Thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, the Son of the living God. Amen and amen. Our passages today are found in three different sections of the scriptures. The first is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. But when you read that, if you would just keep reading all the way down to like, say, 9 or 10 or something to catch the full scope of what Paul is saying there, that would be great. The second one is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And in our journey with the rebel king, we are in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And here, here the rebel king reminds us that he is a king unlike any other king that the disciples could have possibly expected. When my brother and I came of age, it it wasn't long into our driver's license period that the CB radio, the Citizens Band radio, became available for citizens. Well, he was one of the first of his peers to acquire one of these CB radios. And it didn't take him long to figure out the CB lingo and to find his, his companions on the Citizens Band radio network. The only two CB lingo things that I actually remember are, what's your 20 and do you have your ears on? What's your 20 meant, where are you? And in this passage with the rebel king, chapter 17, we start out with Jesus taking three of the disciples, the three Ds, Peter, James, and John, up to the mountain where Jesus is transfigured. He becomes radiant with the light of God's presence in him. In fact, he, he really does live out what Peter professed, son of the living God. So what's your 20? Here we find ourselves on a mountain with three disciples who would become key disciples in this movement that's going to transform the world. So what's your 20? And then, do you have your ears on? Are you listening? Are you tuned in? Alfred E. Newman, who is the fictional mascot for Mad Magazine, I don't know if you remember seeing that guy with his goofy face, but he, he he says, most people talk to themselves because they're the only ones who will listen. And I, as I wrestle with this passage of scripture that we're all quite familiar with, it, it always asks the question, what am I supposed to do? And so I go back and I listen again to what God said. God said, this is my beloved child. This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. What do we do with this passage? Well, God says, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. So then I look at Jesus. And I'm like, so what did Jesus say? So three things Jesus said. Well, you know, we get so hung up on, on um, technicalities and legalities that we may, it's so easy for me to miss some of the really important things that I could be working with. This is a real clear parallel going up the mountain. Jesus going up the mountain is a very clear parallel to Moses who 
he climbed the mountain and his face was so bright from being in God's presence that when he came down from the mountain, everybody's like, whoa, 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 get, get away from us. Put a veil over your face. We don't want to see it as it's scaring us. And also we're going to get sunburned. So Jesus goes up to the mountain and what? He is transfigured. He is so bright, bright with God's presence. When Moses went up the mountain, he received the law. To the stone tablets inscribed with the finger of God. When Jesus went up on the mountain, he received the love. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And this is important for Jesus because this marks a, a turning in his journey to Jerusalem and a cross. It's also extremely important for the disciples who will wrestle again and again and again with the reality that this is the king they waited for, but he is not the king they expected. This is my beloved son, listen to him. So what did Jesus say? Let's not get caught up in the laws and hear what he actually says, because I think God is redirecting us and them from Moses and Elijah. So listen to him, what did Jesus say? First he said, get up, get up. The disciples fell on their faces in worship and also probably fear. And falling on your face is not a bad thing. Worship is a good, good thing. Falling on your sword is a bad thing. And so figuring out the difference is really important. Jesus says, get up. He doesn't kick them. They're not sleeping dogs. And he goes over there and roughs them up. Jesus touches them and says, get up, get up. Get up, wake up, rise up, stand up, speak up, get up. So we ask ourselves here, mm, where am I feeling like I'm on my face? Maybe it's feeling on your face because you failed or because you feel impotent or because you've just been paralyzed. I've had plenty of paralysis over these five months. Places where maybe you feel like you're dying. Do we want to get up? Do we want to wake up? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Get up. So we ask ourselves those questions and then we hear Jesus say next, don't be afraid. Well, why not? I mean, really, why not be afraid? There's plenty to be afraid of, right? Well, because of perspective. This is the son of the living God. Remember that? The beloved of God. And God's name makes a whole lot of sense, the most high God, when you're on a mountain, right? But if Jesus is not afraid, then we don't need to be afraid either, because the words that God speaks over Jesus are words that Jesus then turns and speaks over us. We are God's beloved children. We don't need to be afraid. So then we can just name our fear. What are you most afraid of? Make a list, externalize it, get it on the outside so it no longer has the power that it could have occupying all that rent free in your brain and in your soul. And then take that list to Jesus. Take that fear list to Jesus and just say, I don't know what to do with this, but you told me not to be afraid. So you must be bigger than my fear. That's part of the really, really good news. Get up and don't be afraid. You gotta just keep walking and keep following Jesus because he's not gonna stay on that mountain. It's awesome to see where he ends up going. But his third words to the disciples were, don't tell anyone until I've risen from the dead. Don't tell anyone 
until transformation happens. You know, holy moments are indescribable to other people. They are yours. They are very precious, very private, and indescribable. But they are discernible in changed lives. Jesus is saying, wait until the change comes so that you're not just using words. You are showing the reality of the resurrection, the transformation. I've, I've done quite a bit of speaking in Pennsylvania where there's a particular religious sect that is quite, quite privatized. And this one couple had never, never been into a shopping mall and never seen one of those, those boxes with, with doors that slide shut and then slide open. And this couple stood in front of one of those, watched it shut, watched it open, and he's, he's sort of guarding his wife, like, I don't really know what this is. And an elderly woman on a walker rolled her walker into that box with its sliding doors. And the, the husband is watching, like, what's happening? A couple of minutes later, the, the sliding doors open, and out of the box walks this, this vibrant young woman. The wife looks at the husband and says, looks him up and down and says, you go first. He gets in the, he gets in the box, the doors slide shut. She can't wait to see what happens. He walks out, looks exactly the same. She looks at him again and says, maybe, maybe you need to stay longer. You know, it takes more than an elevator to change us but it could be that elevation helps. Getting on the mountain is really, really important. One of the key things that I'm, I'm recognizing in this passage is that transfiguration is for everyone. No one understands explanations. What we really need in this world is transformation. So I look at this, at this passage and I hear this word that they use about Jesus, Jesus was transfigured. In the Greek word, that is the same word that we, from which we get the word metamorphosis. It is metamorpho, however you say that transliteration. Jesus was changed. He was changed before their eyes. He changed shape or form or appearance in some way. That same word, metamorpho, is used in Romans 12, verse 2, when Paul says, don't be conformed any longer to the patterns of the world. Don't let them squeeze you into its mold anymore. You don't have to look like the world looks, but be transformed, metamorpho, changed by the renewing of your mind. And then the rest of of that passage in Romans chapter 12 goes on to describe what it looks like to have your mind renewed. And, and won't behavioral scientists tell you this, that if, if you change the way you think, you can change the way you act. And if you change the way you act, you can change your life. But I say that we can change the world by this transfiguration that results in transformation. So when you look at then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, same Greek word, metamorpho. And Paul in that passage says, and we who with unveiled faces, remember Moses when he was on the mountain had to cover of put a veil over his face but we with unveiled faces contemplate the lord's glory are being transformed metamorpho changed into christ's image with ever increasing glory that comes from the lord who is spirit metamorpho is for all of us it's not just for that mountaintop inaccessible only to G accessible only to Jesus inaccessible to all of us all of us lay people 
with our feet on the ground. No, it's for all of us, all of us. Doug Hammarskjöld says, God doesn't die on the day we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance, renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. God makes no sense. That we are the beloved of God makes no sense beyond all reason. But when we can be renewed in God's presence, then we begin to be changed. And as a result, the world begins to be changed. When Romans 12, 2 says that you may test and approve what is God's perfect and pleasing will, that goes on to describe what it looks like to be change agents in the world. It's so exciting. And so the question is, first of all, where are you? How are you being renewed? And then second of all, where does God want to change us? Rather than changing other people, where does God want to change us? And how will that look in this world? The Wall Street Journal tells the story of a couple in North Carolina. On March 12th, Jack went to the nursing home to see his wife of 70 years. And as he prepared to leave, his beloved who had Alzheimer's disease, they told him, you can't come back because we're closing down the nursing home. The next day, March 13, he showed up at the door with a suitcase, his meds, his Mac, and, a ch and, all, and his clothes. He rented a room in the nursing home so that he could be with his wife, who didn't even know who he was anymore. His room faces a brick wall and they don't let him leave unless he doesn't want to come back. So for five months, he's been in the nursing home with his beloved, feeding her, tending to her needs, walking back and forth from his room to hers. People asked him, why are you doing this? He said, she took care of me for 70 years. It's my turn to take care of her now. That's, that's what love looks like. That's what renewal looks like. That's Jesus let loose in the world. Imagine showing someone that kind of mountaintop love. Did it change the world? In fact, it is. Let's pray. Dear, dear God, thank you for coming to us in Jesus and thank you for saying those same words over us that you say over him. We are your beloved children. Thank you for making transformation possible in us and then through us. Would you study our hearts, Lord? Would you show us where we've been and who you want us to become? Would you help us to get up, to not be afraid, and to rather than just talk, to show your presence in the world. Thank you that you call us to transfiguration for the transformation of the world. Help us keep our ears on and keep walking. In the mighty name of Jesus, who rose from the dead. Amen and amen. Would you join me in the benediction? If you hold out your hands, go now into this world with a mind that is renewed, 
by the love that'll never end. We go as agents of transformation in this world. Amen and amen. <laughs>